Good morning, everyone, and we want to welcome you uh, to church this Sunday, and we thank you for joining us, and we also just want to say uh, happy Mother's Day to all the moms, especially the, the, the moms who have been a part of this church over the many, many years, um, as well as just moms that have been there for us, and we are so grateful for all that you have done for this church, that you do for others. Um, I especially like to extend Mother's Day beyond just those who are biological mothers, but those who end up being spiritual moms for so many um, in this community and um, to us individually. And I would say that today, if you have a minute, not only to uh, acknowledge your, the moms in your life um, that are biological, but to spend a moment, send a text or an email or whatever you can to all the spiritual moms that you have in your life. Um, and let them know that you are thankful for what they've done. Um, in light of that, for our scripture reading this morning, um, I'm actually going to be going back to the first chapter in Acts, and it, it gives us a, an image there where Jesus' mother is also there in the room. And this takes place um, around the decision of who would replace Judas. It says in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And going back to last week's topic of graduation, I think it was probably very exciting for um, Mary, who started as a mother um, who had the Holy Spirit come upon her so she could have Jesus and she pondered all the things that the Lord told her, but then during the ministry at one point even lost focus and had her and Jesus' brothers come to kind of bring him back, thinking maybe he had been off track, and Jesus even had to say the words, who are my mother and who are my brothers? And then to be there at Jesus' death, but also now to be at his resurrection, and more importantly, now she gets to see who Jesus really was through the beginning of the church. I think that as moms we get to see, um, I shouldn't say we, but as moms you get to see um, this type of development in people. And maybe there's someone on your heart this morning who you haven't seen come around um, where you'd like for them to have a personal relationship with the Lord. And, that's where we'll start this morning is the, the, the kids that are on all the mom's hearts. Let's start this, this morning in prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for all the, the women in our lives, both biological or uh, the women in our lives that just came and took us under their wings in numerous ways. If it was a kind word, a hug, a meal, whatever it might be, an encouragement, they were there to help us along on our spiritual journey. And Lord, I want to just pray for all um, the kids out there that there are so many uh, women are still hoping to reach. Their, their kids, their grandkids, maybe even siblings that they are trying to reach for you. And we just pray, we know that you can go out and do some miraculous things even this morning and touch their hearts. And we just pray that we would trust in your movements, and as we come to you this morning in worship and in prayer, that we would just know that you are working on that situation day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brent. Uh, let us all sing, even though we aren't um, together in one room. Um, from wherever you are, I just ask that as a family, um, that you would just worship in spirit and truth and that you would um, let the words of these songs sink into your heart and that you would pray them with me. In Jesus' name.
that this personal relationship with you, that the joy that we can feel connecting to the creator of the universe can be shared by everybody who puts their faith in you and asks to receive your spirit.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you have made a way, that you have built the bridge between us um, by dying for our sin, and we just thank you so much for, for your presence in our lives, and we ask that we would become more aware of your presence, that we would experience your goodness on a daily basis, the fullness of living in you and in your spirit and walking with you. And Father, we just want to pray for our country, for our community, that, that you would draw more and more people into this relationship with you and that you would guide us, your, your children, to, to spread your love and your good news with everyone that we can so that more and more would be saved. Father, we also want to ask that you would save us from the physical um, problems. We ask that you would help us to find a cure for COVID-19. We ask that you would help us to find um, vaccines. Um, we ask that our leaders would be wise and, and help to protect people in the meantime while we are waiting for these solutions to the problem. And Father, we just want to lift up all those who are out of work and who are struggling financially to, to uh, provide for their families. We just want to ask that you would help, help us to um, work together to provide. I know that there's a way that we could, that everyone can survive this, um, well, well, yeah. Um, and we just want to lift up um, some specific people. I have a friend named Catherine who is struggling with cancer, and I just ask that you would bring healing and comfort to her and her family. I want to lift up a friend, Kelly, who has heart problems, and, and ask for healing and for comfort for her as well. We want to lift up Jody's son, Daniel, um, as he's struggling with a health problem, and we just ask that you would bring healing to him. And, and we also want to lift up Greg and Lynn's son, Thomas, and just ask that you would, you would help him right now. And Father, I know that there are so many other things that we can ask for, and um, you listen to every heart. So, Father, we just thank you so much for listening to us and always providing for us. And we just ask that as we dive into your word this morning that you would help to open our ears and open our hearts to hear you more clearly and to understand you better and become more and more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning we are continuing our series in the book of Acts um, and my focus with this series is that we would um, begin to see how exactly the church navigated through all the mess that they were having to live through both socially economically even politically to bring about the early church I think that if we begin to look at that we begin to make decisions ourselves as Christians as to how we should behave in the midst of our mess. Um, but this morning, we are in Acts chapter 2, and I entitled this sermon, Benefits. I remember the time that I finally got to have my weekends off. I had worked a large amount of jobs for several years, where um, my days and hours very rarely added up to me having the weekends off. It was something that you had to aspire to, it seemed like. Now, was in the, even in the 2000s, I think it's a little bit harder now. I think that sometimes we take for granted how much, uh, it, how nice it is to even have a traditional weekend off. There are many, many who 
just have a Monday off or, uh, or they, they have their weekend in the middle of the week. But I remember the benefits of having the weekend off. I remember finally being able to go to church um, every Sunday and not being fatigued. There were years where I had gone to church after working night shift. I would sit actually feeling um, upset in my stomach because I was actually very, very tired and I was kind of keeping myself awake to, to be at church and, and having those type of benefits. But I also remember that with those benefits came some, some costs. Having the weekends off always meant that there was a little bit of a mess to come back to um, on Monday. There was always a little bit of work that had to be done and you had to learn how to live with that. And here in Acts chapter 2, Jesus kind of gives his disciples the thing that he had been promising them for a long time. The thing that the disciples had wanted for a long time, which was power. They had asked for power. They had asked questions about when was the kingdom coming and when was the power going to be at hand. And Jesus had continually told them that there would be a time when they would have the power they desired. They would have the benefits. Um, I don't know if they were quite aware of what that would entail, much like having a weekend off. I remember coming to back to work on a Monday, uh, and it would be a regular occurrence to go through the complaint box and, and say a quick prayer before I went through all the complaints and comments from my weekend off. And I eventually learned to dwindle those down or to live with them. But I think with every form of power, there is also some things that come into balance. At the same time, when it comes to the Holy Spirit and this power, I think that a lot of people have an attitude towards the church and towards us as Christians, that we are doing this because our parents did it, because it's been done in the past, or it's because we were raised this way. And uh, whenever someone talks to me um, in that light, I acknowledge to them very clearly that as someone who is a third generation ministry person and someone who grew up in the church that I wanted anything and everything not to do with the church when I became an adult. But there was this thing called the Holy Spirit that kind of got a hold of me. And the real reason why most Christians are actually Christians and go to church is because they've had an interaction with the Holy Spirit. So this morning, well, I'll give you a, cre a real quick synopsis of Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4, the, the disciples are baptized as promised in the Holy Spirit. And uh, last Sunday morning in our Sunday school, we went through John 15 and 16. Um, and there's also a little bit in John 14 where Jesus talks to his disciples about this gift that they've been awaiting for. And he has really great descriptive words to talk about the Holy Spirit in those chapters of John. Words like helper, advocate, comforter. He says this is what is going to come for you when the time comes. And in verses 5 through 13, the people respond to what they see happening with the disciples. And verses 14 through 36 is Peter's sermon. Peter gives his first sermon here, and I think that that should not be something that we just kind of overlook. Um, if you have time, I'm not going to go all the way through chapter 2 this morning because um, you guys have Mother's Day things to get to, but I would encourage you to read through Acts chapter 2 and read through Peter's sermon, especially in light of who Peter has been through the Gospels and knowing that this is his first sermon because I think he did a fantastic job. And verses 37 through 41, we have the effects of the truth. I have some exciting transition this morning. The first thing that the Holy Spirit does, though, I decided to break this into sort of three topics this morning. I had a very convoluted sermon, and then yesterday I kind of slimmed it down. There's three things that I think that the Holy Spirit does for us. It unites... It empowers and it convicts. And I think that for most people, we've all had some sort of an experience 
with the Holy Spirit directly or unfortunately through other Christians sometimes with the Holy Spirit and that could be positive or it could be negative. I feel lucky enough to say that when I think back at my first occurrences with the Holy Spirit where I, I experienced something miraculous, they were actually positive. But I do remember as a teenager visiting a, a church that had an evening gathering that we were encouraged to go to where people were doing things, um, saying that it was because of the Holy Spirit, and it was a bit crazy. And at one point, um, someone approached my brother and I in a fashion that was a bit unnerving, and I, when they stood up, I asked them, I was a very brave, I've always been a very brave, outspoken person, and I said, is this really what the Holy Spirit wants you to be doing right now? And they didn't really answer me, and they walked away. I think it's very important that we understand that there should be some qualifiers for what the Holy Spirit is doing or willing to do. And Jesus warns very carefully that the, the worst thing that we could do is actually blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, in essence, comes to unite, to empower, and to convict. And sometimes we get a little off track with that. So the first thing it does is it unites, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. One of the first things that the Holy Spirit does is it unites us. We could say that that was maybe one of the first official church services. But all through the years, the church has come back together, especially in number, in group, and Jesus says, where two or more are gathered. One of the bigger reasons we do this is because we want to have that interaction with the Holy Spirit that unites us. So the disciples were together awaiting this power in the upper room and it came. And they were able to do some things that they had never been able to do before. The other thing that happens in unity is it brings some unity between people. Verses 5 through 12. Now they were staying in Jerusalem and there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one of them heard them speaking in their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then, then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jew and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? I think that one of the great things that happens in this passage is that we have a group of people in Jerusalem who most likely were not considered real Jews by the Jews who lived in Jerusalem. We know enough from Jesus' time to know that they had really come up with a lot of qualifiers for what made you a Jew or what didn't. And one of the things that Jesus came and really specified to the Jewish leaders is that God was supposed to be for everyone, not just the people they decided were good enough. He did this by visiting the Samaritans. He did this by talking to women. He did this by talking to tax collectors and even times Gentiles. Jesus said, God is actually for everyone. And what's interesting in this scene is that we have this small victory when it comes to this standard. A small victory where together in Jerusalem at this point we have this pocket of people who are usually not considered very important, but what they're hearing is that they are important enough that God is speaking directly to them in their language. 
And I think this is important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit likes to come and talk to us in our own language. I don't think the Holy Spirit has ever come and told me directly one thing to do. I think the Holy Spirit may do that for others, but I think that because I am so stubborn, God knows that telling me what to do isn't the way that it's going to work out the best. And the Holy Spirit for me has been more of an encourager of what to do. And I think because of that, I can hear that God knows me well enough and speaks to me well enough to direct me. At the end of them, feeling united by the fact that the Holy Spirit is there for them during this time, they ask the most important question that I think we, as a group of Christians hoping to enlarge the church in our lives, in our community, should hear. What does this mean? I think that's the hope and goal we should all have, is that as we reach people individually, and they feel loved and cared for and united, that they would actually feel this question. Maybe they say it audibly, maybe they don't. And I think the exciting thing is that when you think about this group of people and all the different places that the passages say that they are from, we understand that this was a really fast track for God to get the word out about Jesus in one day. He was creating correspondence from all over the known Eastern European world and a little bit of, of Arabia in just one address. And I think that what's important to understand about this is that the small victory of these people feeling close enough to God to come to Jerusalem greatly turned into a huge victory for the early church as these people went home to spread the good news about Jesus' coming. The next thing that the Holy Spirit does is that it empowers. Verses 14 through 36. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God, um, by man, and God set up a purpose with his foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him. I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently, that the patriarch David died and was buried, but his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath, an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, and he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to that fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he was received 
from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. I think one of the exciting things about this sermon from Peter is that it starts out with Peter making this very strong statement. And it's a statement I think we should all strive to make ourselves. He says, now fellow Israelites, I tell you confidently. I think that we see the empowerment of the Holy Spirit sometimes as things that are more like uh, tricks we can perform or things that we can hold over others, but really the Holy Spirit comes to empower us in a way where we are confident enough to tell someone, I know that Jesus is alive. And we have this really interesting section where um, Paul, uh, Peter is actually quoting the Psalms directly. It says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And what jumped out at me this time as I worked on this sermon is that this was actually a passage that Jesus addressed in front of Peter in Matthew 22, verses 41 through 45. He had heard this scripture being interpreted by Jesus himself as he walked on the earth, and he was now empowered to use it to try and help others to understand Jesus themselves. I think that we as believers have been empowered as well in the ways that we have been a, in encountering the Word of God, even in small amounts, even if we're starting out, where we can then share it with others if we understand it. The next thing that the Holy Spirit does is it convicts. And I think this is the uh, not as popular part of the Holy Spirit. I think we would like the Holy Spirit to only kind of empower us and uh, do positive things, but it's very clear that one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is that it's here to convict us. Not to convict others, but to convict us. In verse 36, we have these very pointed words, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, or Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? I think that the message has been the same. Even for us Gentiles, all these thousands of years later, when we really come to terms with how great Jesus is, and we come to the point where we find out that He died on the cross for us, we come and say, What shall we do? And the answer is always the same. It's the same answer that Jesus actually gave when he was on earth. He replied, Repent and be baptized, all of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. We have been empowered to spread the word, to let people know. And through the Holy Spirit, people can feel the conviction that we often feel I know that every time I go through the scriptures, there's something else that jumps out at me where it kind of gets on me. If you haven't experienced that yet, then I would suggest you go through the book of James. Because the book of James, Jesus' little brother, doesn't leave anything on the table. It will let you know where you're messing up in no uncertain terms. When you put all three together, though, what we have is 3,000 people that day being converted. And those are just the people within earshot. We don't know about how many people were reached when all of the folks that were there went home. In verses 37 through 41, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord call will call. For many other, uh, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number 
that day. More were added to their number that day, but in verse 47 it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their church daily those who were being saved. This was what I've discovered about um, the church when it comes to the book of Acts, is that we love this verse. We love verse 47. Um, I, I've heard it quoted numerous times. Praising God and enjoying the favor of people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And we say, yea, amen. That's what I want. I want that for our church. I want that for our community. But we regularly don't like the few verses that precede it. Verses 44 on. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and good they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There's usually a little bit of a disconnect. We would like to see numbers added to our daily and numbers added to the Lord daily. But unfortunately, those benefits have a cost. And the cost is us actually living what Jesus has asked us to live. To take care of those who are in our church. To take care of those who are amongst us. To make sure that we are there for them. So this morning, the thing that I really hope that you can take away with you about the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is a difficult issue. Um, this morning in our Sunday School class, we went through 1 Corinthians on um, speaking in tongues because this is a, an exciting one. Whenever I bring up the chapter, second chapter of Acts, um, people are concerned about the speaking in tongues because of, unfortunately, negative experiences they've had. And uh, I think that the biggest thing that we have to hold on to as Christians when we talk about the Holy Spirit and as we live our lives as Christians is that the Holy Spirit is here for us to unite us, to empower us, and to convict us. It should unite us to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That means that we are able to lay down all the th differences that we may have within the room and focus on the foundation that is Christ and what he says will happen. If that is something that can no longer be established, it most likely means that we may have some things in our life that we need to remove if we can no longer unite in this way. The Holy Spirit comes to empower us. The Holy Spirit does not come to make us feel lesser or not as important as anyone else within the church. It comes to empower us. And I think it comes to empower us in the ways that we are able to serve and the giftings and callings that we have. For years, as I ran from going into ministry, I had numerous people telling me I should go into ministry, and my answer was always no, no, no thank you. It started all the way since I gave a communion meditation at a church in Eugene. But in the evenings, I would go on a run, and I'd run to the Amazon Park in Eugene. We lived close by, and I'd run into the darkness there, because at night it was very, very dark, and you could see the, the city lights on the perimeter all the way around you, but where you were, it was just dark. And there, I would talk to God. Usually, not very happy. It was very much like the Psalms. I talked to him about problems in the world, problems in Christianity that I saw, problems in my life. And the next thing I knew, I was preaching pretty much. And the Holy Spirit didn't tell me, you should be a preacher, because I think the Holy Spirit knew that my answer would be no. The Holy Spirit just came and encouraged me and said, yes, this direction. And every time, even then, I'd say, no. But he continued to encourage me and encourage me and encourage me until I found where I needed to be. 
But now, even in ministry, I'm discovering that there's a lot of ideas about being able to do everything and being good at everything that is deemed ministry. And I've discovered that that is not true either. There are things that I am good at, and there are things that others within the church are better at than me. And to divert those to them gives them an opportunity to minister, and for me to stick to what God wants me to be doing, what He's empowered me to do. And I believe that's the same for everyone that is part of a church. That we are all parts together with different giftings and callings that God has empowered to move us in helping those around us in a way that we feel the most fulfilled. And the last thing the Holy Spirit does for us is it convicts us. Whenever we turn, start to turn a deaf ear on the Lord is when we start to really get into trouble. When I, uh, when I was in seminary, I had a class. I was working here at the church already and uh, very busy. And I remember going through a bunch of classes that weren't really necessary for ministry. And I was very excited to start my core ministry classes there at NCU. And there was a class... And um, I believe the class was going to be helping me in my leadership of the church. I was a young pastor, kind of lost. But when I got to the class, I discovered that the, the title of the class was a little bit misleading. And the class was completely about spiritual um, encounters with the Lord or spiritual disciplines like fasting and meditating and um, others, like uh, one that's called, escaping me, being alone, solitude, thank you, audience. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that the class was on uh, something that would help me, and what I found was it was a class on these spiritual disciplines where the core focus of all of it was just for me to have a connection with God. And eventually I confronted the teacher saying, I, this was not the class I hoped it would be. This was not what I really needed. And she, she made it very clear to me, she said that if you, as someone going into ministry in any form, if you cannot keep a constant connection yourself with God, then you'll be lost. And not only will you be lost, but you'll lead others astray. In that same class, I remember fasting for a week, and uh, I fasted through food. I said, I'm going to skip food. And it was very easy for me. I actually found out that my, uh, I had a lot more time to do my work if I wasn't eating. It wasn't too hard for me to go five days. But at the end of the week, she asked me how I did, and I said, it was not too hard. I just had a lot of extra hours to not eat. And she said, well then, you probably should have given up something else. And she pointed at my laptop. She said, what about that? And I said, oh no. I got my church work. I got my school work. I got everything. My whole life is on this laptop right now. She said, you should have given that up for a week. And I was convicted. I relied on that laptop far too much. Our growth stops if we stop being challenged to grow. One of the core things that the Holy Spirit does, and in a way I think that really speaks to us as well individually, is I think the Holy Spirit convicts and says, you can do this. I had a recent interaction with the uh, camp manager. We've been praying about some solutions to uh, shore up some funds for the camp. And I, he sent out an email saying, Congre you know, we're very excited because one of the one of the financial problems we have has been solved. And I said, that's great, I'll be praying for the other situation that we are praying for. And he said, well, that's become more complicated because we found out that we need to make digital content for the school, schools for us to receive those funds. And it was one of these times where here I was talking to him, like in the book of James, about praying for him, and the Holy Spirit was kicking me, saying, that's your realm, that's your gift, that's your calling, you need to help. And so, 
I spent last weekend helping him get those lessons ready, and we submitted them, and we received the funds that we required. The Lord gets on us sometimes, but in a way that is fruitful. Last uh, yesterday, I was I met with the camp manager again, and he was very excited to say we're going to be having camps this summer. We're not sure what it's going to look like, but we're going to have camps. And it was so ex great to see the excitement on his face because we'd gone from a place of dread and fear because of financial problems to a place where now we felt like one way or the other we could make something happen for kids this summer. And that came from the Holy Spirit moving in different ways. So as you guys um, go out this week, I first say that if you have not had a personal interaction with the Lord through the Holy Spirit, there's not much I can do except extend the offer that probably you've heard a million times to open up your heart and try and connect with the Lord. Our time of communion is merely one of those times. Communion just means interaction. Jesus modeled it by just having meals with people. But for us to sit down and commune with God, Jesus says, I'm leaving the Holy Spirit for you to have that happen. Go and commune with me. And for those of you who have been in the Spirit and who have been in ministry within your lives and in many different ways, especially those of you who are moms or spiritual moms, I would encourage you to dig deeper and see what the Lord says to you through the Holy Spirit. One thing that I know about this time that we're in right now is that everything takes more effort. Interacting with people takes more effort. Caring for people takes more effort. And honestly, even stuff that came as easy as worship and interacting with the Lord takes more effort. I've had to re retool my life to find the times and spaces where I can have my interaction time with the Lord. And for each person it will be differently. For my time, I spend a lot of time doing yard work with worship music. And for whatever reason, the two together helps me interact with the Lord. But for you, it may be different. For you, it may be a quiet time. It may be watching online services or online worship. But I would extend to you that if you are not feeling that connection with God like you did in the past, to put in some more effort. Knowing that God is wanting to interact with you during this time. Let us end in prayer. Lord, I thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit, that we're not alone. Uh, the world likes to make it sound like the church is just kind of on its own and we're kind of going through the motions and the hope. In the, in the prayer that you will return and that we will be justified. But we know the truth. The truth is that your Holy Spirit is here with us now. I pray for those who are having a difficult time, um, especially in their faith walk right now, who, are, who have had things that have been their go-to and those can't be going on right now. I pray that they would find a way to interact with you more during this time. And I pray that when your Holy Spirit comes to us, and, or if we have interactions, that we would be united with you, that we would be united with each other, that we would feel the presence of you, and that we would know that you are with us, as well as it would unite us to other believers, and just remove all the thing that the world keeps on putting up to separate us. And Lord, I pray that you would empower us to do whatever we can for those around us, if it's just words if it's a kind act, whatever it might be, that we would be able to be empowered to minister to people. And most of all, Lord, I pray that if the Holy Spirit comes and interacts with us, that we would be open to listening to the conviction, to the thing that you want us to work on, the thing that we probably knew it was kind of whispering to us that needed to change. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen.
this morning for our Mother's Day service, and we just hope that you have a wonderful, blessed day. Um, and I encourage you again, if there is um, some spiritual moms that have been in your life, to just take a minute to send them a quick message. Let them know that you, you appreciate what they've done through their ministry um, to you, and it would, you would be surprised how much it will make their day. And let us end in prayer. Lord, I just pray that you bless our coming out and our going in. I pray for wisdom during this time for each of us and in everything we say and in every interaction we have as things are so tense. I pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, lead us in our interactions with those around us and that uh, the goal would be to reach everyone for you, that they would say, what does this mean and how can I be saved? I pray that we would have that type of influence on people and I pray that you would be there with us going ahead of us being an advocate being a helper in Jesus name we pray amen